Have you ever thought about what happens when you make a transatlantic call? In 1839, the idea of having a cable that stretched across the Atlantic was the dream of a few engineers who were inspired by the birth of the telegraph. In 1858, less than two decades later, the first message was sent across the Atlantic by telegraph cable, reading, Glory to God in the highest, on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. So how did an idea as world-changing as linking Europe to the Americas go from dream to reality in under two decades? Let's take a look. After the invention of the telegraph by William Cook and Charles Wheatstone, the inventor of Morse code, Samuel Morse, believed that the creation of a transatlantic communications network was a possibility. Experts continued to debate the idea until in 1850, a line was laid between Great Britain and France, the longest one of the time. That same year, construction began on a line heading from the northeast coast of America in Nova Scotia to Newfoundland. This northeastern cable was set to be the largest communication cable yet, and its construction was led by a man named Frederick Newton Gisborne. The cable was eventually completed, though Gisborne's company collapsed in 1853, as the line didn't prove profitable. However, after that failure, Gisborne met a businessman named Cyrus West Field. He believed in Gisborne's idea of extending the existing cable across the Atlantic to Britain, and he had the funds to make it happen. Samuel Morse served as the technical liaison, and an oceanographer was consulted as well. After the initial planning, Gisborne and Field founded the New York, Newfoundland and London Telegraph Company. Field funded this venture with help from the US and UK governments, as well as through selling stock and funding a large portion with his own funds. The project finally took shape in 1857, when the first attempt was made to lay the cable. Manufactured by Glass Elliott and & Company and R.S. Newell & Company, the copper inner cable was covered in latex, which engineers believed to be strong enough to protect it from marine life. It was then covered in tarred hemp, itself surrounded by a sheath of iron wiring. This made the cable relatively flexible while also being incredibly strong. Two ships, the HMS Agamemnon and the USS Niagara, were used to tow the cable, setting off on their cable-laying journey from Southern Ireland on August 5th. Day one of operations started off with a bang, or rather a snap, as the cable broke and it had to be retrieved off the bottom of the seafloor. After that, the cable broke again, but this time it was too deep to retrieve. So the operation was shuttered until the next year. Following the two breaks in the cable, plans were altered and it was decided the two ships would set off from opposite continents, meeting in the middle to connect the cables and then head back to their respective ports, pulling their portion of the cables. The cable unfortunately broke again after just six kilometers, and then again after 100 kilometers, and then again after 370 kilometers. Things weren't looking good. Crews were up for a third try, and they set out on July 29, 1858. Despite navigational errors due to the electrical charge of the cable, this time the ships successfully navigated to their respective ports on the 4th and 5th of August. The Niagara docked in Trinity Bay in Newfoundland, and the Agamemnon docked on the western coast of Ireland. Utilizing horses, crews then positioned the shore sides of the cables in the correct places, and they were connected together. On August 16th, the first message was sent, followed by a message from Queen Victoria to US President James Buchanan. The Queen and the President sent two rather wordy messages, which weren't exactly designed for this type of communication. Reception over the cable was terrible, and each character took two minutes to transmit. The first message took just shy of 18 hours to send. The cable's initial success didn't last long, though. On the 3rd of September, the cable failed. This was due to engineers boosting the voltage on the line from 600 volts to 2000 volts in hopes of speeding up the transmission. This caused the cable to short out somewhere along the line, a short lifespan for the first transatlantic cable. So this is the story of how the first transatlantic cable came to be. These first cables were covered with copper, but our modern transatlantic cables are all fiber optic. 
the first of these having been laid in 1988. This has greatly increased their efficiency. Whereas the first cables could transmit a word every few minutes on a good day, modern cables can transmit the equivalent of 84 billion words per minute. What an improvement!